Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a burglary detail. You get a call that someone has broken into a necktie manufacturer's. A large supply of hand-painted ties have been stolen. Your job? Check it out. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Saturday, September 10th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Bernard. My name's Friday. I was on my way into the office, and it was 8.31 a.m. when I got to room 45. Burglary. Hi, Joe. Morning. Anything for us? A uh, patrol car picked up a couple of high school kids about 3 a.m. No? Oh. Found them hanging around a filling station over on Jefferson. Mm-hmm. Juvenile's checking them against those other filling station jobs last week. Said they'd let us know. Okay. All right, it's going to be a scorcher. Yeah. You noticed it last night? Hmm? The heat. Oh, yeah, sure I did. I don't think I slept more than 30 minutes. Wonder about air conditioning the house. What? It's pretty expensive, isn't it? Well, I guess it depends, doesn't it? Yeah. Be worth it, though, weather like this. Well, we don't get these spells too often. Well, I don't know, Joe. Lots of the new houses have air conditioning. Yeah. Just the bedroom might not cost too much. You know, one of those portable units. Mm-hmm. I get it. Burglary Friday. Yes, sir. Just a second. All right, what's the address? All right. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir, I see. Right away. Bye. Tie manufacturing company out on Western. Somebody cleaned them out last night. Over a hundred dozen neckties. Yeah. Owner says he knows who did it. Frank and I drove out to a small manufacturing shop on Southwestern Avenue. 9.03 a.m., we interviewed the owner, George Prosper. He told us the back door had been forced open during the night and that a large supply of hand-painted neckties had been stolen. You see right here? The lock's broken. Yes, sir. That's how he got in. No mistake about it. Uh-huh. He you take anything else beside the ties? Oh, a little cash, $80, $90. But the ties are the important thing. Oh? Yeah, they're worth at least $5 a piece retail, all hand-painted, you know. Yes, sir. Some of them are worth more special designs. Why is that? Well, they're made up for the individual, one of a kind. Oh, I see. Of course, most of the ties he stole weren't specials. They were from our wholesale stock, Christmas orders. Mm -hmm. I'll admit it doesn't feel very much like Christmas today, but we have to get our orders filled before the end of October. Mm -hmm. I certainly hope you'll be able to get the ties back for us in time. Yes, sir. Now, you said you had an idea who the thief might be. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Morgan Gilroy. Well, who's he? Young fellow used to work for me. I let him go first last week. Uh -huh. Just wasn't dependable. Always late in the morning. Careless worker, too. Yeah, well, why do you blame him for the burglary? Well, he was very upset when I fired him. Said his wife was having a baby. Said I didn't have any right to let him go without notice. I see. Told him I'd warn him off enough. Gave him a whole week's pay, and that seemed more than fair to me. Did he say anything else? Well, yeah, he threatened me. Oh? Said I'd be sorry I fired him. Said I'd live to regret it. Uh -huh. Made quite a scene. Told him if he didn't get out, I'd call the police. Did he leave then? Well, not right away. He quieted down some, asked me to change my mind and keep him on. Said he couldn't be out of work now that he had to have a job on kind of the baby. Mm -hmm. I told him there are plenty of jobs to be had. If a man really wants work, he can find it. Yeah. Different when I was his age. Had to earn your wages. Mm -hmm. And you take young fellas like Gilroy, careless, irresponsible, always looking for shortcuts, always looking for an easy dollar. Never give value in return. Yeah. That's why I'm sure it was him. Just the sort of stunt he'd pull, easy way to earn a dollar. Well, then he's got something to learn, Annie. Hmm? This was the hard way. <laughs> Frank and I called the crime lab. While they checked the premises, we continued to interview the victim, George Prosper. He gave us a description of the suspect, Morgan Gilroy, and Gilroy's home address. He also gave us a detailed description of the stolen property. 10.17 a.m. The lab reported that they were unable to find any useful fingerprints on the Jimmy door. Pictures of the Jimmy marks were taken. There was no other physical evidence. 10.57 a.m. Frank and I drove out to the address Prosper had given us. It was a small apartment house on Fountain Avenue in Hollywood. The Gilroy apartment was number seven. Uh, 
Yes? Morgan Gilroy in? No, he isn't. You Mrs. Gilroy? Yes, sir. We're police officers, ma'am. This is Frank Smith. My name's Friday. I'm pleased to meet you. Be all right if we come in for a minute? Well, I guess it'll be all right. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm not fixed up. I kind of overslept this morning. Yes, ma'am. Were you out late last night, Mrs. Gilroy? No. How about your husband? What about him? Was he out late? Well? Don't you think you ought to tell me why you want to know? It's a police matter. Well, then maybe you'd better talk to Morgan. Yes, ma'am. Do you know where he is? At work. Now, where does he work, Mrs. Gilroy? For a time manufacturer. Which one do you know? Prosper's. George Prosper. That's the owner's name. Mm-hmm. How long has your husband worked for him? Six or seven months. And that's where he went this morning, did he? That's where he goes every morning. Mm-hmm. Something happened to Morgan? We'd like to talk to him, that's all. Then why don't you? I told you where you could find him. Yes, ma'am. The Prosper Tie Company. I don't know what the address is, but it's in the phone book. Well, we just came from there, Miss Gilroy. Well, I don't understand. Didn't you see Morgan? No, ma'am. Your husband doesn't work for him anymore. What? He was let out last week. Well, I don't believe you. That's what his boss told us. Well, Morgan would have said something about it. No. Oh, you've made a mistake. You must be talking about a different person. No, ma'am. Well, it's got to be a mistake. Well, sure, Morgan gave me his paycheck last night. Every Friday night he gives me his paycheck. He got paid yesterday. The same as every week. Do you still have the check? No, not exactly. Well, what do you mean? Well, it wasn't the check he gave me, not really. Oh. You see, he'd cashed it on his way home from work. I see. But it was the usual amount, $80. Mr. Prosper must have paid him. What time did your husband get home, Ms. Gilroy? Last night? That's right. Well, he was later than usual. How late? If Morgan's in some kind of trouble, I've got a right to know. I've got a right, haven't I? I suppose you'd just answer our questions, would you? He wouldn't have done anything wrong. Not at a time like this. You see, we're... We're going to have a baby. I see. Morgan doesn't even think about anything else. He wants everything to be just perfect when the baby comes. That's why he couldn't have done anything wrong. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Yes, ma'am. That's why, whatever it is... Well, it just has to be a mistake. Well, you can help us clear it up. All right. What time do you come home? About... About 2.15. A.M.? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Did he say where he'd been? He called from the shop about 5.30 yesterday afternoon. Said they had a rush shipment to get out, that he'd be working late. Told me not to wait up for him. Had he ever worked this late before? Once or twice. Not till 2.15, maybe, but till nearly midnight. Were you awake when he got home? Yes, sir. Then you're sure of the time, 2.15. Yes, sir, I'm sure. You see, I couldn't get to sleep. I was kind of worried about him. I guess I kept watching the clock. It was 2.15 when he came in. What did he say? He was kind of put out, provoked about my still being awake. He said I ought to get my rest on account of the baby. Mm -hmm. I guess I sort of flared back. I said it was his fault on account of him being out so late. Oh, it wasn't a real fight or anything like that. Yes, sir. He said I oughtn't to blame him that we'd need all the extra money he could make. And he took out his wallet and gave me this week's pay, like I told you. Mm -hmm. Did he bring anything else home with him, Mrs. Gilroy? With him? Extra clothes, ties, anything like that? No. You mind if I look around the apartment? Well, I know where everything is. If you'll tell me what you're looking for, maybe I can help you. Well, that's all right. I can make out. It's just the bedroom? Yes, the bed isn't made. Don't worry about it. I wasn't feeling very good this morning. Yes, ma'am. Would you like some coffee? No, ma'am, thank you. What about your friend? No, I don't think so. Did Mr. Prosper really say he fired Morgan? Yes, ma'am. Well, did he say why? Well, you better ask your husband about that. Just isn't fair. A time like this. Mm-hmm. You don't appreciate Morgan. None of the people he's worked for. Yeah. Man does his best. This is the thanks he gets. Mrs. Gilroy, these ties belong to your husband? Well, yes. You know where he got them? Sure, there's some he made at the shop. Samples. I see. Does he have any more of the same kind? I don't think so. Mm. Don't tell me all this fuss is about a couple of ties. Well, it's a few more than that, ma'am. Oh? A hundred dozen. <laughs> Except for the three ties which Frank had found in the bedroom, we were unable to turn up anything else that seemed to answer the description of the stolen property. 12.15 p.m. Frank stayed at the Gilroy apartment to wait for the suspect while I drove back to the tie factory. George Prosper identified the ties taken from Gilroy's closet. He said that they were samples manufactured in his plant. He also said that they had been given to the suspect and had not been stolen. 1.36 p.m., I checked Gilroy's name through R&I. They had nothing on him. 2.17 p.m., I returned to the suspect's apartment. Hi, Joe. Hi. Any sign of him? No, not so far. Where's Miss Gilroy? She's lying down. Oh. 
taken this pretty hard when all the pieces after you left. That's a shame. I guess you can't blame her much. No. And the heat and all. She's bound to be upset. You find out anything? Well, these are Gilroy's time. Yeah. Prosper gave them to him. Says they're somewhat similar to the ones that were stolen, but they're not the same. Uh Uh-huh. Well, you want to go out for a sandwich? Yeah, I guess so. You eat already? No, I wasn't hungry. Mm -hmm. Can I bring you back some? Oh, milkshake maybe. That'll do it. Okay. Chocolate? Yeah, fine. I won't be long. Frank? Yeah? Miss Gilroy is all right, isn't she? Well, I guess so. I mean, she doesn't need a doctor or anything like that. Well, I don't know, Joe. Well, you'd know more about it than I do. Well, I suppose if she needs a doctor, she'd call one. Yeah. Well, hurry it up anyway, will you? Sure. I thought I you. Yes, ma'am. What happened to the other officer? He went out to get some lunch. Oh. You feeling better? Yes, thank you. The apartment's so stuffy today. That's what it was. Yes, ma'am. No, that isn't what it was at all. Ma'am? It's you and that other policeman. You've got me so nervous, I don't know whether I'm coming or going. Well, I'm sorry we had to bother you. You're just wasting your time. Morgan won't be home before six o'clock. He never gets off work and... I can't seem to get it through my head that he's not at the shop. Yes, ma'am. Look, the minute he comes in, I'll telephone you. Or if I hear from him, I promise, the minute he comes in... Well, it might be better if we wait. Won't you try to believe me? Morgan's honest, completely honest. Yes, ma'am. He hasn't done anything wrong. If he had, I'd know it. He'd have told me. Well, there's one thing he didn't tell you, Miss Gilroy. Oh? That money he brought home last night. Well? Where it came from. Frank and I waited in the apartment until the suspect, Morgan Gilroy, came home. 6.17 p.m., we took him into custody and drove him down to the city hall for questioning. He was very uncooperative and for nearly an hour refused to discuss his whereabouts the previous night. 7.08 p.m., we continued the interrogation. How'd you happen to lose your job last week, Gilroy? Ask the boss. He says you weren't dependable. That's his opinion. You afraid to tell your wife he fired you? Who says I didn't tell her? Did you? Well, maybe you'll feel more like talking in the morning. Morning? That's right. Well, you can't keep me down here tonight. Is that right? You want to drive Judy out of her mind? You saw how she acted when you guys took me in. Well, what are you trying to do to her? We're not doing anything to her, Gilroy. All we want is some straight answers from you. It wasn't enough losing my job just when I needed it the most. Now you guys got to crawl on my back, too. When'd you get your last paycheck? From Prosper? Yeah. The day you fired me? That was last week sometime. I guess so. You gave your wife some money just last night. So? You told her it was this week's pay. Well, I had to tell her something, didn't I? Yeah. I didn't want her worrying about me being out of work. I had to tell her something. Where'd you get the money? Borrowed it. Yeah. Maybe it looked like I was stealing, but I wasn't. I was going to tell him I was taking it. It was just a loan. I started drawing unemployment. I thought we was buddies, Steve and me. Somebody turned you over to the cops for a lousy 80 bucks. Who's Steve? Steve McGill. Isn't that why you picked me up? When were you with us, McGill? Last night. What time? Five o'clock, huh? Till when? It must have been nearly two. It was a little after when I got home. Where were you? I met Steve at a bar over in Vermont. What's the name of it? Black Pony. What'd you do then? I had a couple of drinks, bite to eat. All right, go ahead. Some other guys came in, friends of Steve's. I met him once or twice, too. Mm-hmm. Somebody said, let's get up a poker game. I told him I couldn't afford it. I didn't have any cash to spare. And Steve said for me not to worry that if I ran short, he'd stake me. Yeah. We all went over to his place. I did real good for the first couple of hours. I only had five bucks to start with and ran it up to over a hundred. Is that right? They were all ribbing me. About how I was the one that didn't want to play. Yeah. Along about midnight, my luck started turning. By 1.30, I was cleaned out. Always seemed to be second high. Mm-hmm. Get a straight, sure as fate, somebody else would have a flush, second high. The game break up at 1.30? Well, they played on a little longer without me, 15, 20 minutes. I stayed on because I wanted to make a touch from Steve after the other guys went home. All right, go ahead. I didn't know how to bring up the subject. Not that Steve can't afford it. He's got plenty of dough, and he won over a couple of hundred in the game. Mm-hmm. I was kind of beating around the bush, and all of a sudden I noticed how drunk he was. Couldn't get his pants off. Mm-hmm. Just toppled over on the bed and went to sleep. At least he sure looked like he was asleep. Mm-hmm. Money was still laying there on a the table where we'd been playing over 200 bucks. I only took 80. That ought to prove I ain't a thief. If I was, I'd have taken it all. What'd you do then? I went home. Did you stop off on the way? Well, I couldn't have. Ask Judy. She'll tell you. I was there by a little after two. Were you in the neighborhood of the tie factory last night? No, within a half a mile. What's that got to do with it, anyhow? Where's this friend of yours live? Steve? That's right. 
A little street just off Western, Gramercy Place. You got a telephone? I guess so. You know the number? Not offhand. It must be in the book. I'll check it, Joe. Last name's McGill, huh? That's right. So what the heck's going on here? You guys didn't even know about Steve. He didn't turn me in. Hmm. Well, who did? A lot of ties were stolen last night. Factory you used to work for. Ties? That's right. Well, you think I had something to do with it? Your ex-boss does. Well, he hasn't got any right to accuse me. He threatened to make trouble. Well, I may have sounded off when he fired me, but it was just talk. How could I make trouble for him? Somebody did. contact the suspect's friend, Steve McGill, until the following morning. He confirmed the story Gilroy had told us and refused to press any charges against him. From McGill, we got the names of the other three men who had played cards the night the tie factory was broken into. They also confirmed Gilroy's alibi. Sunday, September 11th, 10.46 a.m., Morgan Gilroy was released. Frank and I went back to the office. Now we got nothing. That's right. You think his wife was telling the truth? Hmm? About him getting home at 2.15. We can't prove he didn't. No, I guess not. Well, it seems to be cooling off a little, doesn't it? Yeah. Probably would have been able to sleep last night, too. Yeah. That's my luck. Well, maybe you can grab a nap this afternoon. No, I don't feel right when I sleep in the daytime, Joe. Isn't good for a person, you know. Throws your system right out of whack. Mm -hmm. Except for my brother-in-law, Armin. He can sleep any time, any place. No strain at all. Yeah. Okay. Burglary Friday. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've got it. Well, when did it happen? I see. Right. Goodbye. Men's clothing store out in Crenshaw. Owner came in this morning to do some work on the books. Uh-huh. Somebody jimmied the back door during the night. Sold a supply of suits, slacks, sport coats. Yeah. And a batch of hand-painted ties. <laughs> Frank and I drove out to Nimbo's men's store on Crenshaw Boulevard. We talked to the owner, Carl Nimbo. He showed us how the store had been entered and gave us a description of the stolen merchandise. The thief had apparently followed the same M.O. that had been used on the Prosper Tie Company. We were unable to learn anything more about the suspect's identity. Several days later, a tie shop in Hollywood reported the loss of over 200 knit ties. The following night, a men's clothing store on Wilshire Boulevard was burglarized. Investigation indicated that all these crimes were the work of the same man or men. Burglars who were known to have used similar M.O.s were interrogated. No leads were developed. Monday, September 19th, 8.06 p.m. Frank and I were getting ready to go off duty. You want to stop by the house on your way home? No, I'm pretty tired. I think I'll hit the sack early. We could watch a little TV. It's supposed to be a good fight tonight. It's too late for that now, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I guess so. Oh, we could watch something else. You're not going to go to sleep at 8 o'clock, are you? No. Well, come on, then. I'll get it. All right. Burglary Smith. Who? Oh, yes, sir. Sure, I remember. Yes, sir. I see. And what's that address? We'll meet you out in front. Right away, yes, sir. Guy owns that tie factory, George Prosper. Yeah. He's calling from a bar over on Normandy. Uh -huh. One of his stolen ties just walked in. <laughs> We drove out to a small bar and grill on the corner of Normandy and Kingsley Drive. George Prosper was standing in front of the place when we pulled up. He walked over to us. Evening, Mr. Prosper. Uh, good evening. How are you? Pretty fair. You sure this is one of your ties now? Positive, positive. It was a special. Worked out the design myself. I see. There isn't another one like it anywhere. I see. Can you point them out to us? Mm-hmm. I see. Through the window there. That corner booth. That one there, huh? Yeah, tall fella sitting alone. Okay, thanks. Uh, you want me to come in with you? No, sir, we'll take care of it. We might need you later on, though. Whatever you say, you know how to get in touch with me. Yes, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night, sir. Well? I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Okay, sit down. Well? We're police officers. Okay. What's your name? Trandall. Dick Trendle. You got a job? Sure. Doing what? CPA. Public accountant? That's right. Must make pretty good money, huh? What makes you think so? The way you're dressed. I'm single. I don't have a lot of expenses. It's a nice suit. Thanks. Remember where you bought it? Sure, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Went up there on my vacation a week ago. Can we see the label? Okay. Okay. 
Yeah. One drink? No, thanks. My pleasure. Nope. You ever been arrested, Trendle? Sure. Tell us about it, will you? Speeding? Nothing else. No. You get that tie up north, too? No. Where'd you get it? Fellow I met a couple of nights ago. Got to talking to him in a bar. What bar? Oh, on Olympic, down toward town. Don't remember the name of it. What about this fellow? We were talking, said he was in the clothing business. Happened to mention my hobby was stamp collecting. Yeah. Said sure was a coincidence. What do you mean by that? One of his customers was a stamp collector, too. Had the factory make up a special tie for him, designed it like rare postage stamps. Oh. It's this one right here, the one I'm wearing. Uh-huh. Offered to sell it to me. Yeah. Because a customer it was made for it left L.A. You have the tie with him? In his hotel. Took me over there to show me. What hotel was it? Oh, I don't know, a little place a couple of blocks away from the bar. You think you could find it again? Yeah, I guess so. Did you go up to his room? Yeah, he showed me the tie. Showed me a lot of other clothes, too. Did you buy anything else? Nothing else I needed. I stocked up when I was in San Francisco. Didn't need the tie either, but it was a real bargain. Yeah. Three fifty, it's all he asked for it. Felt like this is worth at least seven or eight bucks. Mm hmm Sure couldn't see how he was making any profit selling it at a price like that. He made a profit. Well, it doesn't seem possible. It must have cost him more than three fifty. No, it didn't. Huh? But it will. Dick Trendle gave us a description of the man who had sold him the tie. He agreed to accompany us to the bar where they'd met. 10.17 p.m., Frank and I interviewed the bartender at the BTJ Cafe on Olympic Boulevard. He remembered the suspect and said he had been in several times during the past week. He couldn't tell us his name or address. We left the bar and canvassed the vicinity for the hotel where the suspect had taken Trendle. 10.58 p.m., Trendle identified the Mortensen Hotel as the suspect's residence. Frank and I went inside and talked to the clerk on duty. To the best of my knowledge, there's only one person staying here who fits that description. That's Mr. Lafferty. Mm -hmm. He's one of the nicest gentlemen you ever meet. He's in the clothing business. Mm. Is he around now? Uh, let me check his box. Yes, yes, he must be in his room. The key's not here. What room is that? That's uh, 212. He's very careful, Mr. Lafferty. He always leaves his key at the desk whenever he goes out. All right, thanks. He's generous, too. Generous to a fault. You don't say. Hey, sure. See this tie? He gave it to me. Is that right? Yeah, it's one of my favorites. That's too bad. Hmm? You may have to give it back. <laughs> Frank and I walked up to the second floor. Room 212 was at the end of the hall near the fire escape. The transom was open and we could see a light inside the room. Who is it? Come on, open up. Yes, sir. Just a minute. What can I do for you, Jeff? Police officer, stand still. Oh, police. You're wasting your time. I don't believe in firearms. He's light, Joe. What did I tell you? All right, where's the stuff? I suppose you mean the items I stole? That's what we mean. I've already managed to dispose of a good deal of it. What's left is in the closet, in the I'll bureau. Check. Oh, by the way, the burglar kit's under the bed. Thanks. Always believe in cooperating with the police. Things seem to work out better that way. Yeah. Although, frankly, I'm surprised you weren't here sooner. Is that so? Last week. That's when I was expecting you. Oh, I'm sorry we were late. Well, it looks like we've got everything we need, Joe. All right, let's go. You didn't overlook the tools. Don't worry. Last week, I, I was certain you'd be here then. Mm hmm Right after my second job. I've never been able to pull more than two before, uh, without being arrested, I mean. You don't say. It was four this time, you know. Yeah, we know. Four jobs. Well, that's a new record for me. Well, let's don't let it go to your head, huh? Oh, I don't take all the credit. If I'd ever worked Los Angeles before, you probably would have found me sooner. Mm-hmm. Uh, have to go somewhere else when I get out. Yeah. Maybe up north to Seattle. I never worked there. Mm -hmm. Might be able to pull five jobs before they catch me. Set myself a new record. Yeah, well, that's not likely. You'll see. Just wait till I get out. We won't be around that long. The story you've just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 7th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Russell Herbert Lafferty was tried and convicted of burglary in the first degree, four counts. Because of his previous record, he was adjudged to be an habitual criminal and was sentenced to life imprisonment in the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. 
Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department.